quick um, bit of housekeeping. I guess we are off our usual schedule of whatever first Wednesday of the month that we've been having it for a few months. Uh, and I think through this summer we're going to be on a bit of a hiatus, but sometimes we might have one sort of spontaneously as the opportunity presents itself as it is today. So um, for those regulars, just be aware that we are um, off our usual schedule, but we'll keep you posted if and when we have these kinds of talks through this summer. So today we are really happy to have with us Dr. Julie Meaton, who has been working with the Tarkas for a whole number of years, 15 or so years, and has been stationed here for the last couple of weeks, and she leaves tomorrow. So if you are, if you have some burning questions after the talk, that don't get answered. You can find her um, today and tomorrow in the lab. And she's a vertebrate paleontologist and a functional morphologist who specializes in mammalian carnivores. She's interested in how we can examine ecology in both living species and in the fossil records using morphology. She's particularly interested in how climate change and the extinction events of the late Pleistocene have affected the morphology and ecology of living and Pleistocene species. She's currently the lead investigator of Natural Trap Cave, where they are excavating Ice Age mammals each summer to determine the role that climate change plays in both the morphology and genetics of the mammals found at the site. Additionally, they are using a microfaunal and pollen record to recreate Pleistocene climate in New Latitude, North America. She's also involved in several other projects related to Pleistocene mammals, including direwolves and saber tooth cats, right here, and an investigation of a frozen Beringian wolf puppy from the Yukon in Canada. So, today she's going to talk about caving for carnivores. Thank you, Dr. Meechan. All right, thanks. All right, so um, today I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, background and a little bit of information about uh, my uh, my other site that I work on, besides Rancho La Brea. Um, this is called Natural Trap Cave, so uh, let's go there. So why do we care about Natural Trap Cave? What's special about it? We'll take, we'll take you into a little background and then we'll actually take you to the site. Um, <laughs> so Natural Trap Cave, we'll start. <laughs> Natural Trap Cave actually has a continuous fossil record from before the last glacial maximum, approximately 30,000 years ago or so, um, to the present. So we actually still have things getting trapped in Natural Trap Cave, although small things, not big things. Um, it encompasses a great fluctuation in climate, this time period does, and we see that climate at Natural Trap. So this is just um, a climate curve, basically that crazy wavy blue line that you see uh, represents climate. You'll actually see that at this point right here, climate rises sharply and then sort of levels off. That's actually the break between the Pleistocene and the Holocene, and that's one of the reasons why we actually put that break there. Um, and Natural Trap Cave really captures uh, the space here in this red box. So we can actually see a lot of different climate fluctuations throughout the late Pleistocene and into the early Holocene. Um, it captures the end Pleistocene extinction event. Um, we actually can see that happen in the fossil record at National Trap Cave, and so that's a really cool thing about this site. Um, and it's great conditions for ancient DNA preservation, uh, which is sort of uh, the whole reason why we actually started this project, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the cave is constantly cold. Even in the heat of the summer when it's 95 degrees, blazing hot on the surface, the cave is about 42 degrees Fahrenheit, so it never gets above that. Um, it's very humid, uh, about 80 to 90 percent humidity, so it's very the air is very damp and heavy in there. Um, there's little to no human activity over the last 30,000 years. Um, the only people that have been in there are cavers within the last 100 years that have gone in there, as far as we know. Um, there's not very many of those. It's gated now. The BLM doesn't let people go in without a permit and few other disturbances. So you might think about some normal fossil sites. Um, after the animals died, before they were fossilized, there are things that happen like trampling events, so other animals ran over their bones. Um, there's all sorts of weather events that can happen, um, scavenging events. Uh, those are pretty much non-existent at Natural Trap because once the animals fell in, they were basically just left alone for the most part. I'll tell you a little bit about some exceptions to that. So if you want to know where it is, um, here's the state of Wyoming. It's this square in the middle of the country, or sort of the west middle of the country. Um, here's a, a map of all the different counties in Wyoming, and Bighorn County is the county that Natural Trap Cave is in. Uh, Natural Trap Cave is at the very tip top of Bighorn County, about a mile to Montana as the crow flies, 
a little bit further if you're driving a car because you have to go around this giant canyon called Devil's Canyon. So um, right there, there's also a reservoir that runs right next to it, a river. That's, uh, that's important for what I'm going to tell you later. So there is water somewhat nearby, but not directly next to the site. So this is the road leading up to National Trap. Um, those are the Bighorn Mountains. Uh, in the background are different mountain ranges in Wyoming. Um, really beautiful out there, but pretty remote, so there's not a whole lot around. Um, and this is the road that leads to National Trap Cave. And I put road in quotes because it's really not much of a road. Um, this is probably, probably the best part of it. Um, the other parts of the road are basically like giant rocks and boulders that you have to sort of like go over with a giant 4x4 vehicle. Uh, you cannot get a car to National Trap Cave, uh, with the exception of this guy named Juan, who uh, is our caving expert. He can drive uh, a car anywhere, so, <laughs> uh, but, but normal people know. <laughs> All right, so this is the actual site. Um, you can see that there's this nasty, rusty grate over it. Um, they graded it up in about 1971 because someone actually drove their VW Beetle into the cave. <laughs> uh, it didn't go in all the way. They were able to winch it out with a truck. So, uh, and nobody died, thank goodness. Um, but they graded it over nonetheless. Um, they also didn't want uh, people going down in there and poaching fossils and other things like that. They wanted to protect the resource. But, you might notice that there's this little, this little ridge here. And if this nasty, rusty grate wasn't there, you might not actually be able to see the hole from standing right above it. And that's important because that's basically what happened to animals. They're coming down this ridge. They're probably running. Herbivores are probably running for their lives. Carnivores are running for their dinner. Um, they're not paying attention to what's in front of them, and in they went. So uh, their misfortune is now our good fortune. So let me give you a little background about the site. Um, the site was originally found in the early 1900s by people who enjoy caving. So people who go up in the wilderness and they want to check out caves and go in. So people have known about the cave for about 100 years. Um, but the first people who actually went in were a team um, from the 70s. They went in and explored it, but they actually didn't do any excavation. However, the head, uh, the head uh, explorer on that trip, Dr. Larry Lowendorf, um, actually talked to this guy, this is Dr. Larry Martin, um, who has since passed away, but he was actually the lead PI at the University of Kansas on the original excavations of Natural Trap Cave, um, along with Dr. Miles Gilbert from the University of Missouri. And the two of them excavated Natural Trap Cave from 1974 to approximately 1985. So they had about 11 years of excavation, so that's a pretty long time. All the fossils that they found from National Trap went to the University of Wyoming, or not, excuse me, University of Kansas. So University of Kansas has a fairly large collection of Natural Trap Cave uh, fossils, and they're in really good shape. Stuff that they found in the 70s and 80s is, is primo Pleistocene fossils. So this is what it looked like in the 1970s. You can see this big ridge here, right? That's the one I was talking about that sort of obscures the hole from view. Um, you'll notice that this is where their opening is. Um, they actually have a different opening than what we use, uh, and the reason being because when they go into the cave, uh, they actually have a scaffolding system set up. So the, the cave is 85 feet from the mouth of the cave to the floor. Um, and so they used to like go up and down the scaffolding and, uh, and I was lucky enough to have one of the original excavators on my team my first year, uh, Dr. Xiaoming Wang from the LA County Museum. And I asked him, I said, did you go up and down that scaffolding? And he said, yes. And I said, was it rickety and scary? And he was like, yes. And I was like, all right, I'm glad we're not doing that. <laughs> so you might notice this big A frame with the wires coming down from it. That's the entrance we use. So this is what it looks like today. This was our team. Uh, before we excavated for the first time in 2014. So there was a 30-year hiatus between when uh, Martin and Gilbert excavated Natural Trap and when our team went in. Um, one of the other important members of my team is the guy sitting in the black shirt and the uh, khaki pants, a um, couple people down from me. Um, his name is Dr. Alan Cooper. He's at the University of Adelaide and he's an ancient DNA specialist. 
And together, the two of us were the ones who basically decided to reopen this cave. Um, Alan Cooper actually came up with the idea when we were in a working group meeting uh, when I was at uh, the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center. Um, and he had gotten DNA from Kansas, from Natural Trap Cave before, but he thought it actually might be really beneficial if we could go into the cave and get DNA directly out of the bones that were in there because they've basically been in a natural refrigerator for the last 130 years, or 130,000 years, excuse me. So uh, we wanted to make sure, we wanted to see if the DNA preservation was any better than after sitting in a museum for 30 years um, with the DNA sort of degrading. So that was the point. And I said, that sounds like a great idea. I will run point on morphology. And the two of us together came up with a project to correlate um, changes in ancient DNA and changes in morphology with climate change and other environmental changes throughout the end of the Pleistocene and into the Holocene. So we don't use the scaffolding. We actually just use ropes. So we rappel in and we ascend out. Um, the 85 feet every day, sort of, uh, we make jokes about our commute to work for more of that. Um, so this is me on rope um, in the first year, and that big bunch of sticks behind me uh, looks like a bird's nest. It's actually a pack rat nest. Um, and the pack rats are really our friends, and I'll tell you why when we start talking about the microfauna in the cave. Um, but this is basically how we get in and out. This is what the cave looks like from the inside. Um, it's very open and spacious. You don't have to crawl through anything to get to anything, which is good because I probably wouldn't like that. Um, so you basically go down that rope, and this is the rope that we all use to go down. Um, we have two ropes. We have a rope that we use for, um, for entrance and egress, and we have uh, a rope that we use for hauling things up right there. So that's how basically we get everything out of the cave. It's on a triple pulley system. So the guys up at the top basically pull up all our dirt and fossils and everything, um, much to their chagrin. But we have to get it out somehow. Um, and then right below the hole there, which is about 20 feet around, is the dig pit. So the pit where animals fell in, obviously, is where we're going to get the best fossils. Um, so it's right there. The cave itself is probably about the width of a football field, maybe a little bit wider with all the little nooks and crannies you can go into. Um, so it's open, spacious, very light. Um, and, and it's fine to be in there all day. Um, we just sort of bundle up because it is, remember, 42 degrees. All right, so, so who is there? And I want to preface this by saying um, the environment at Natural Track Cave was a little bit drier and more open than the environment we have here at Rancho La Brea, at least in the Pleistocene, um, and today. So we find a mix of species. Some of the same species overlap with the fauna that we find at Rancho La Brea, and some of them don't to some extent. All right, so who do we find? Um, we have these guys here at Rancho La Brea, but they're not very common as far as carnivores go. Um, these are the American lion, Panthera atrox. Um, so if you want to get an idea of how big it was compared to a modern lion, there it is. Max size of a modern lion is about 300 kilos, about roughly 600 pounds. American lion is a little bit bigger than that. So uh, max size, 900 pounds. So a 900 pound cat, uh, they would probably, their, their head would be here on me so I could like turn and look at the American lion in the face. Um, yeah, I wouldn't really want to meet one, although they did coexist with humans, so. Fun, fun time. <laughs> All right. So uh, one of the species we have at Natural Track Caves in abundance uh, that's also known from, from Rancho La Brea but is very uncommon um, is something called the American cheetah-like cat, mm -hmm. Mirasinonis trumani. Right. So this species was actually described from Natural Track Cave. Um, we have a lot of these individuals, uh, and so we can learn a lot about its ecology from this site. Um, these guys are most closely related to the living puma, although they have morphology that does resemble the living cheetah, hence, uh, hence the moniker, American cheetah-like cat. Um, also, uh, this, this painting was drawn by uh, a paleo artist friend of mine, Mauricio Anton, um, and it's the American cheetah-like cat chasing the pronghorn antelope, which are still found in the area today. And for a long time, we wondered if this um, symbiosis, maybe not a symbiosis for the pronghorn, um, <coughs> this relationship, this uh, predator-prey relationship actually held where 
The American Cheetolite cat specializes on the pronghorn. Uh, the reason why uh, people wonder that is because the pronghorn is the second fastest land animal alive, right after this African cheetah. And so they wondered, you know, uh, why is it so fast? Well, oh, maybe it's being chased by the American cheetah, right? Um, turns out we just got some stable isotope evidence to suggest that the American cheetah-like cat was specializing on pronghorn. So uh, more to come on that at SVP this year. All right. So we also have um, these lovely horse, horsey horses. Um, some of the horses that we have at Natural Trap Cave uh, very much resemble the horses that we have here at Rancho La Brea, the western horse. Um, but we also have another species of horse called uh, the stilt-legged horse that was just named recently um, by some friends and collaborators and also some people that work here at Rancho La Brea. Uh, so that one, I always think of it, I know it wasn't like this, but if you guys are familiar with the art, art of Salvador Dali where they've got like everything on stilts, I always think of the horse like that, like the stilty <laughs> horse walking around. Um, we have these guys, which are also found here, uh, bison and sequins. So a relatively large bison, uh, relative to modern bison. Uh, we also do have the modern bison in the Holocene record at National Track. And we've also got these guys, which I love, which are also here, yesterday's camel, Camelops concernus. Um, we found a bit of camel at National Track, so they seem to like that habitat. All right. So this will give you an idea of where we're digging. This giant gaping hole is about 10 feet tall, uh, maybe about 9 feet. That guy there in the green shirt and the white helmet is about 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. So it'll give you an idea of how much space there is above his head. This giant hole was dug by Kansas. We didn't do that. So that was there when we came. Uh, so instead of digging down deeper, which is mostly backfill, as you can tell by the ladder that goes to nowhere, <laughs> um, we decided to go out from the interior of the site and that seemed to prove very fruitful. By the way, that ladder is like eight feet tall, so there's a lot of backfill. We would need like a backhoe to get all that out. The sediments are very sandy, very silty, so basically a fine aeolian dust has just been blowing into Natural Trap Cave over the last hundred thousand years or so and that's basically what all these things are buried in with an occasional rock or boulder sort of interspersed in there um, and if you're wondering what you're looking at um, these are the ones that I can actually identify from this picture but um, all of these other things are bones as well <laughs> so basically this is what the sediment looks like when you excavate a patch of bone there's just bones and bones and bones and bones and bones so it basically goes on forever I asked Xiao Ming about how long do you think it would take to excavate the rest of Natural Craft Cave if we went every summer and did it, and he said, oh, probably about 100 years. <laughs> so there's going to be plenty of fossils in Natural Trap Cave for future generations of paleontologists to go in and find. We're never going to get it all. This is what uh, the fossils look like once we get them washed and processed. This is my lab manager, Kathleen, in this photo. She's amazing and basically runs my lab for me while I'm doing teaching and other administrative nonsense. Um, so you can see that there are a couple different colors of bones. Those vertebrae over there, these ones right here, um, they look really creamy white, almost like modern bone. Those are Holocene in age, so they're actually probably about 4,000 years old. Um, and then we have this uh, metapodial, this horse metapodial in the foreground that's actually been sampled for ancient DNA. You can see that little chunk taken out. Um, that one looks more modeled in appearance, and that's because those are going to be um, Pleistocene in age. So those are probably anywhere between 30,000 years old and 12,000 years old is about um, the majority of our Pleistocene fossils. So Alan Cooper, who is my co-PI, has actually done quite a lot of ancient DNA work at Natural Trap. Um, three of the papers that he put out on Natural Trap uh, before we even started on this project, include these three. Um, one was headed by Beth Shapiro and is all about bison, and this paper is cool because what they found is that bison from Beringia in Alaska have the same genetic signature as bison from natural traps. So we know that bison were actually moving through that, um, ice, that ice-free corridor from Alaska to Wyoming um, during the last, uh, you know, last 30,000 years or so. So that's pretty interesting. 
Um, this one in the middle here, they actually sampled uh, the American lion from natural trap caves and showed that it is, in fact, genetically most closely related to the living lion. So it is a sister species to the living lion, and that was shown from natural traps. And then finally, um, there's a horse paper down here, and there's actually one that just came out not too long ago that wasn't done by Allen, but uses horses from natural traps, and basically found that there are two distinct genera of horses there. So there's uh, multiple, multiple genera. We're not just talking about equus. We're talking about equus and something else that's distinct. We have a name for it now. It's called Harrington hippus, um, and that's the stilt-legged horse. So these are the kind of things that we are looking at at natural traps. Right now, Alan and I are focusing on the canids of natural traps, and we're also focusing on merosinonics and bison. So those are the three groups that we're really um, looking at right now and trying to come up with something. And I'll talk about canids in a bit um, in much more detail. The uh, bison, we haven't done a whole lot of work on it yet, and the merosinonics, we've gotten an entire genome for merosinonics now from a petrosal from the collection in Kansas. So we know a lot about a lot more about merosinonics now than we ever did before. All right, so we all love the big stuff. I mean, that's probably why you're all here at Rancho La Brea. It's so cool and interesting. But as some of you may already know, um, the microfauna is so important for doing things like climate and environmental reconstruction. And I always like to think of it in this way. If you're a giant animal, you're a mammoth, or you're a horse, or you're a bison, and you don't like the weather, what do you do? You get up and move, because you can, right? But if you're a mouse, or a frog, or a lizard, and you don't like the weather, too bad. You're stuck. You're not going anywhere. Even if you decided to start walking, you'd be dead before you got 10 miles, right? So you're stuck. And so basically what that means is that small animals are really well adapted to their climate. So they're adapted to their microclimate even um, through the, the process of natural selection. And so if we have a really fine record of microfauna at a site, we can really do a good re environmental reconstruction from them. And luckily for us, at Natural Trap Cave, we have those lovely pack rats. So what the pack rats have done for us is basically, over the last 30,000 years, and we, and we know we have a record from almost that much. Uh, the pack rats have collected uh, little bones of little animals from all around, bring them into their nest, and then they pee on them. And that's important because the pee actually hardens and turns to amber. Mmm, that's amber. No, it's just hardened pee. Um, and so the amber actually fossilizes everything into layers, and so we could actually do a, a, a cross-section through a pack rat nest and actually see all the layers that the pack rats have accumulated over the years. And our pack rats have those nests that are really high up. So in addition to the amberization of the fossils, they actually kick fossils down into the cave constantly. And so our microfaunal record uh, gathered in all the dirt that we have in the cave actually shows that same layerization that the pack rat nests have. And we have all sorts of microfauna. Um, not only do we have rodents, which we would expect, but we also have rabbits, um, we have small weasels, we have some bats, not as many as you might think that are in a cave, but we do have some. Um, and then we also have some things that are kind of weird. Um, we have lots of frogs and fish and lizards, and uh, we think those are being brought to us by birds. So birds basically grab whatever they want out of that reservoir that's a couple miles away, they fly back, Maybe they were nesting in the cave too because it's protected. They eat their stuff and then they puke up the bones. So we've got all that stuff from birds and we have it from the pack rats. So we've got this really wonderful microfaunal assemblage in natural traps. Um, in addition to uh, microfauna, we actually have a great pollen record in natural trap too. This is wonderful because pollen will give you a great idea of what uh, flora was in the area. All the pollen blows in, and then it forms these wonderful layers, so you can see how the pollen assemblage has changed through time. That's exactly what we've done. We collected 60 <coughs> dirt samples, or actually we collected hundreds of dirt samples in 2015, um, and we analyzed 60 of these. Um, we've identified four pollen zones um, present in our pollen sediment sample, ranging uh, through about 130,000 years to the present. 
Um, the oldest material that we have contains um, relatively, relatively no trees, but abundant sage, aster, and grass. So we know it's pretty dry and open. Um, the next stage that we have is dominated by sage and amaranth, and grass is even and grass is lower than previous. Um, the late glacial period we have is characterized by increasing trees um, and grass. And then finally, the uppermost sediment is characterized by abundant trees, lower grass, and low sage. So basically, cooler and wetter. So the records suggest an environmental sequence of cold, wet early on before um, that pollen abundance, cold, dry when the, pol the pine pollen was in low, then cold, wet, full glacial cycle, and a warm, wet Holocene. So that's basically from the whole pollen record all around the cave or not all around, the, all around where the cave is. So we use the cave and outside the cave. Unfortunately, we don't have a good Holocene record inside the cave, but we have a good Holocene record right outside the cave. All right, so in addition to all that stuff, I wanna tell you a little bit about the work I'm doing personally at Natural Trap, um, the species that I work on. Since I'm a carnivore person, as you guys already know, um, I really like the dogs and the cats, and um, the dogs are the most interesting thing at Natural Track right now, so that's what I'm working on. The question that was sort of posed um, by me was what kind of wolves were present at Natural Track Cave? And the reason I asked this is because when I was going through all of the literature that Martin and Gilbert had published previously on Natural Track, they said that there were both gray wolves and dire wolves from natural traps. And I'm like, mm hmm, you know, I, I don't know how true that is and what their abundances were, but I'm guessing that these two species did not coexist in great numbers at natural traps. Um, and the reason being is because of the stuff we know about modern coyotes and wolves. They coexist in certain places, but they really don't get along. So when wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone in 1995, um, they basically had a huge effect on the big coyotes. They began to chase them and kill them for fun. And so they actually eliminated many of the coyotes at, Nat at Yellowstone when they moved in. Um, here's a coyote carcass that was killed by wolves. And so I thought, well, geez, if, uh, if, if they're both at natural traps, then you know one of them is going to be like in trouble, right? The smaller of the two. And when I looked in the collection, I've looked at a thousand dire wolves. I've done a lot of work on dire wolves. I looked in the collection and I was like, I, I can't tell what these are, which was the first red flag. I was like, I can't tell if these are dire wolves or gray wolves. So I don't understand how they basically made that distinction when they did the identification. Because nobody did any statistics back then. It was just basically like, okay, this is dire wolf, this is gray wolf, this is dire wolf, this is dire wolf. So I was like, hmm, no. So I was like, let's throw some statistics at this. Let's actually like do some measurements and see what we can find. So I used the jaws because they were fairly abundant at Natural Trap Cave. Um, and I wanted to compare them to a bunch of different kinds of wolves to see what we had. So I had a huge sample of uh, dire wolves here from Rancho La Brea. Um, I used a large sample of modern gray wolves from North America. I tried to get them from all over the, the continent, but also, I wanted to make sure I had a sample from Wyoming, which might be the most closely re related living species today, maybe not. Um, and then I was at the American Museum in New York, and I came across this species called the um, Ice Age Beringian wolf that was from Alaska. Turns <coughs> out they're, they're a subspecies of modern wolves, but they're extinct. Um, so I decided to measure them too, and to give you a little background on the Beringian wolf, uh, they were described uh, by Leonard et al. in 2007. They're found primarily in uh, Pleistocene, Alaska, and the Yukon. Um, there's not a really good record of them from anywhere else uh, when this paper was published. They're morphologically and genetically distinct from living gray wolves, and they classify them basically as a subspecies of the gray wolf. And they're morphologically distinct from Canis dyrus. We don't know about the genetics yet because nobody has published anything on Canis dyrus genetics, but I'll talk about that in just a bit. Their teeth and jaws are robust and worn and broken from eating hard food, much like the dire wolves at Rancho La Brea. So dire wolves at Rancho La Brea um, have that, you know, that worn, they sort of cracking bone for a living, and that's what these Beringian wolves were doing too. 
And we think they went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene. So that's what uh, Beringian wolf is. So where do natural cat cave wolves fit in all of this melee? Um, here's a plot of those three species that I used for comparison. Um, these blue circles, those are all the dire wolves that I measured. Um, and that's where they fall. They group together pretty nicely. Those green squares are the, no the modern North American gray wolves that I measured. And then these red triangles are the Alaskan Beringian wolves. And there's a tiny bit of overlap between them and the dire wolves, but they pretty much fit in their own morpho space. Um, so where do natural trap caves fit in and all that? Right here. So this is where we got natural trap cave wolves. They fit right in with those Beringian wolves from Alaska. So likely they are not dire wolves. Likely they are not modern gray wolves. They are probably these Beringian wolves, which makes a lot of sense because the two red dots up at the top were actually where we definitively have the Beringian wolf in natural trap cave is that dot right there on the bottom. So there's this huge ice-free corridor that basically shoots you out right there to natural trap cave. Um, and we know from previous studies that two of the most abundant food sources for wolves uh, were found in both locations. So um, the bison paper I told you about already. Um, and also uh, the musk ox was there. And uh, fox dogs had all found that the musk ox was the wolf's favorite food before the last glacial maximum. And they are found in both localities. So we don't have genetics on the musk ox, but we do know they're found in both localities. So if uh, these two prey species went from Alaskan Beringia to Natural Trap Cave, it really stands to reason that the wolves probably followed them down. So that seems to be likely what happened. Uh, we have the first Beringian wolves radiocarbon dated to approximately 25,800 years ago at Natural Trap Cave. So that means they had to go through that ice-free corridor before that time. They dispersed into um, the continental U.S. before the last glacial maximum. Um, so this gave us a lot of new insights into wolf diversity and wolf biogeography in North America because we didn't know that the Beringian wolf was actually found in continental U.S. before this study was done. So it kind of made us think about how wolves behave and how they migrate. Um, and it was really only the beginning. It's kind of turned into this horrible, like, canid mire now, and I'll tell you about it. Um, my postdoc and I then did another study on the, the postcrania of the Beringian wolf, and we found that it had this short-legged morphology, so basically a normal body size, but just short legs. Um, and this morphology actually survived into the mid-19th century in North America. Uh, we actually studied um, historical populations, of, uh, of gray wolves, which have the same sort of genetic signature as the wolves today, but they have this, this morphology that's very similar to the Beringian wolf. Um, so we showed that there are multiple losses of morphological diversity in gray wolves, one at the end of the Pleistocene and one in the mid to late 1800s, and we think actually so both of them are correlated with huge losses in herbivore fauna. Um, the megafaunal extinction, and then in the mid to late 1800s, that's about when European settlers were moving across the west and just killing bison off in huge numbers. So it might be that the wolves were actually responding to a lack of prey. Um, and one of the thoughts that we had is that um, their legs became longer, they were selected to have longer legs to travel further distances to find prey. Right? They didn't have to before, but now they do. So what are the next steps in Natural Trap Cave and in the Canid Project? Um, we're in the process right now of analyzing ancient DNA from Natural Trap Cave wolves. Um, we're getting crazy results. Uh, we kind of don't know what's what right now. Um, we have to analyze ancient DNA from dire wolves. This is actually being done right now by three different teams across the globe. So by the end of the year, there will be a dire wolf DNA paper. Uh, probably several, and we're talking whole dire wolf genome, not just mitochondrial DNA. So we're going to know what dire wolves were by the end of the year. Um, I actually already know, kind of, because um, I'm working on all these projects with all these different groups, um, but I can't tell you. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. um, we also want to compare ancient DNA from all the different Pleistocene wolf groups around, and from coyotes. It turns out we have this specimen at Natural Trap that we thought was a coyote. We have this huge metapodial, this huge hand bone. 
And we, you know, my postdoc and I were like, oh, this is, this is a wolf. Like, this, is, this matches a wolf. And our ancient DNA collaborators have told us that it's a coyote. So either we've got some hybridization at natural traps, or coyotes were a whole lot bigger in the Pleistocene than we thought. So uh, we've got a lot of jumble here. I've also been told by my collaborators in Australia that they think they actually have dire wolf DNA from natural traps. So there might be dire wolves there. I didn't think there were. Morphology says there aren't. But who knows? So we've got a lot of work to do. So uh, this is way more complex than we had originally thought. Wolves and coyotes and dire wolves and dogs of all kinds might have been hybridizing in North America in the Pleistocene. So we have to basically try to tease this all apart. So what's the future of the site in general? Uh, we're going to do a whole lot more work on natural traps. We're going to try to focus on the paleo-botanical aspects of natural traps. We've got a lot of great data on that. Um, we've got three years of fossil material to uh, analyze and catalog and process and do all this stuff with. Um, we have also got uh, volcanic ash dates um, from natural trap caves that we need to pursue. So we've got all this volcanic ash in the cave. Um, we ran out of money for excavation, um, so last year was our last year of excavation for now. But my collaborator Jenny McGuire and I are trying to pursue funding to continue excavations next year. So hopefully we'll be able to get money for two more years of excavations. That's our goal, to be able to pursue other projects. And if you're interested in um, National Trap Cave and you want to watch me on TV looking really awful, um, you, can, you can go and watch this YouTube video. It's uh, live on the Wyoming PBS website. We had a crew come out and do a special on the show. And you don't have to write down the web link if you don't want. Um, a special on Natural Trap Cave, rather, on their show. Uh, all you have to do is Google Wyoming PBS, and there's a link to the Natural Trap Cave video right there. So it's easy to find. So before I finish, I want to talk a little bit about um, what, uh, what I've done at Rancho La Brea in the past and what, um, what our team is doing uh, in the future. So most of the work that I've done here at Rancho La Brea revolves around um, a couple of different species. Uh, the first species is the coyote here at Rancho La Brea, Canis latrans or cut eye. So one of the things that um, I've done is measure the postcrania of the coyote here, and then a couple neighboring sites in California, McKittrick and Maricopa. And basically what we found was that in the Pleistocene, um, which are the dark gray boxes, um, coyotes were way bigger than what we have today. And you can see that the error bars overlap, but that's about it. I mean, we've got huge disparity in body size in coyotes uh, between the Pleistocene and today. And we're seeing that, obviously, at Natural Trap Cave, too. So I don't think it's just a phenomenon that was known from California. Um, and uh, uh, my collaborator, Larissa, who's sitting right there, has also um, done some work on coyotes, and we're sort of looking at um, post crania and diet and all sorts of different things and that's one of the things we'll be working on further for the project we're pursuing now. So this is one of the things I've done here. Um, the other species that I've worked on uh, at Rancho La Brea is Smilodon. So I've done quite a lot of work on Smilodon, both on the crania and the post crania. Um, the paper that I really love working on, I actually did x-rays of Smilodon humeri um, and showed that they were very, very robust. They had all this cortical bone. Um, basically using their forelimbs as a tool during prey catch um, and subduing. Um, and I'm actually continuing this work. Uh, my collaborator Jack Sang and I are working on um, a finite element analysis model of Smilodon uh, humeri. So we're going to have numbers on bending strengths and things like that so we can see how strong they actually work. Um, and then I've also worked on uh, Smilodon uh, crania. Uh, my collaborators and I did this study um, where we looked at jaws at the, in the different pits um, and basically came to the conclusion um, that when climate's getting warmer or drier, um, Smilodon becomes bigger and more specialized, and when climate becomes cooler or wetter, Smilodon uh, um, becomes smaller and less specialized, so it looks more like a conical tooth cat in terms of its jaw morphology. Um, and and we're going to sort of ground truth this with the project that we're going to 
embark upon, we're embarking upon this summer. So the next project um, that I'm working on, along with um, my collaborator, Louis DeSantis, um, Emily Lindsay, who's the curator here, um, and then a, a couple other folks, um, Robin O'Keefe, who was here last week, um, and John Southen, who is running all our radiocarbon dates, and Wendy Binder, who is uh, the lead PI at Loyola Marymount. She couldn't make it here today. Um, we're embarking on this huge project um, based on the assumption that the tar pits at Rancho La Brea act as time intervals where ecological environ and environmental factors can be measured, um, at least we hope. So that's one of the things we're actually testing in this project. Um, we've got this lovely climate curve here, right, from, um, the, from the Greenland ice core data. Um, and this blue thing is climate, and you can see that same spike going up. That's the end of the Pleistocene, and it stabilizes out mostly in the Holocene. Um, these little peaks here in climate are um, sudden warming events. They're called Dansgar Oshiger events. Um, and we are lucky enough that the pit, um, the depositional windows at Rancho La Brea sort of span some of those same time periods, at least we hope they do. So we might actually be able to see um, some changes in climate in some of these pits. Um, the two that we're really interested in for the most part, we're not doing all of these, pit 91 is one we're doing. Um, Pit 13, we hope this actually correlates with maybe um, the last glacial maximum or close to that. And then Pit 61, 67, um, it's sort of happening right before that Pleistocene extinction event. So we're hoping that we can capture some of that uh, snapshot in those two pits. So our project entails radiocarbon dating, Rancho La Brea. Uh, it's basically a wholesale radiocarbon dating project. We're going to do approximately 400 radiocarbon dates. Um, to ask the question, what are the depositional timing of the pits of interest that we're looking at? What is the climate during those time intervals? And do, do species changes correlate with climate change? And what can this site and these dates tell us about the end Pleistocene environment and about that Pleistocene Holocene transition. So, our research plan includes obtaining, uh, this is actually 400, this is the type of our fix, approximately 400 additional radiocarbon dates. Um, we want to pinpoint the timing of several deposits here. We're focusing our, effort, our efforts on five different species. Um, three are the most common carnivore species here at Rancho La Brea. And then the last two are two large herbivore species that are here, and we're finding that we're having a hard time finding enough of them in some of the pits. And we want to correlate the morphological changes that we see in the dated specimens to climatic or environmental events. So we want to see basically how um, climate and environment are affecting these species. And then, of course, we're going to look for patterns among or within species in our project. So that's basically what we're doing here. Um, we just started. Uh, that's why we're all here, so we're basically getting started. We're picking out specimens to radiocarbon date. We're starting collecting some of the metadata that we want to collect, um, and we're sort of getting on the road with the with this project. So we're all excited about it. Um, things have been going well so far, and we hope things continue to go well. And so with that, I just wanted to thank um, all the people who have worked on all these projects with me, and then everybody here at the Tarpist for uh, being so helpful and for um, inviting me to give this talk. And then here's my funders. And I will just leave you with this slide uh, collage of all of my crew at Natural Trust. So, thank you. Happy to take questions.